I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, verses of Scripture. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say whether they be things in the earth or things in the heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he, speaking of Jesus, reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. We'll draw your attention to the first phrase of 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, speaking of Jesus. In the first phrase of verse 22. And in his body, his flesh, through death, he presents to us, or presents us holy and unblameable, unprovable in his sight. I want to use for a subject this morning, the cross still stands. You may be seated. The cross still stands. Now I'll say this right now. I'm sure there's not the cross over in Israel on Golgotha's hill this morning. I'm sure there's not a cross there. If there is, it's not the one that Jesus bled and died on. But the cross still stands, though it's not erected there on Mount Calvary. But one thing we know, that God has taken the cross and made it a symbol of his sacrifice and his gift to the world, where his son Jesus Christ bled and died on the cross that we could inherit and receive the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. The cross still stands. Have you, have you stopped and considered that when you drive across the country, you will see crosses everywhere. A huge cross in Branson, going into Branson. We just put a cross up on our property here on a hill far away over here. Jerry did a great job putting that cross together and, and others joined together and helped put it up. And for that, we're grateful. But you stop and think about hospitals have crosses on them. Ambulances have crosses on them. People wear crosses on a necklace around their neck. They have them on their rearview mirror on their car. A cross. The cross is certainly a symbol of God's love and God's sacrifice for you and I. But don't forget for a minute that it is also a symbol of bloodshed and agony and suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As the songwriter said, I will cherish the old rugged cross, and I will. I think of crosses, how beautiful they are, some gold, some silver, some wood, some metal, some in jewelry, and how beautiful those crosses are, but none compares to that bloody cross on Golgotha's hill where the lovely Son of God died for our sins. The cross still stands. The devil cannot remove it. It, it is all over the world. God has even made crosses in the sunrises and the sunsets. Everywhere you look, there is crosses, and God is reminding us that the cross still stands for each and every one of us. I want to talk about the cross still standing. And, not, and of course, I'm not speaking of the one over in Israel, but I'm speaking of that symbol and that emblem 
of suffering and shame that Jesus Christ died on that cross. I want to begin by saying the cross still stands as a resting place for our faith. The cross stands for a resting place for our faith. Your sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Rest easy now. God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for us. Rest easy now. God paid the debt that he did not owe and he paid the debt that we did owe and gave us eternal life. You can rest now. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The cross still stands as my resting place. The cross still stands at a place where God says, I love you. The cross still stands at a place in my mind and in my heart that where the God of all creation paid the ultimate price for my sin debt and I had been kidnapped by the devil and taken bondage and under deep bondage and torture of sin in my life. But Christ paid the ransom And not only did he pay the ransom for me, he bought me with his own blood. He redeemed me with the blood of his cross that he shed upon that cross of Calvary for you and I. The cross is a resting place. You say, preacher, I stumbled, I tripped, I sinned this week. Well, go rest under the cross. Preacher, I'm weary and I'm, I'm hurting and I don't know what to do with my life than to go rest under the cross. Because there you'll find a God that's not out to get you and hurt you, but a God that came to be gotten and taken under the wrath of God Almighty himself and give himself a sacrifice and a ransom for our sins. Aren't you glad God's not out to get you for bad? God's out to get you for good, amen. I mean, would say, I've been got. Come on, can you say, I've been got. Amen, been got. I'm glad I've not been had. Hello. Before I got saved, I'd been had lots of times. I'd been had. Amen. Remember one time I was driving around cutting a few di- uh, donuts and uh, on the highway in my car, a little old hot rod car I had a Comet and 289 and it had low gears in it. My brother Galen had put a real low ratio rear end in it and, and man, you just push the gas pedal and it'd twist you joints off, pop, pop, pop like that because it would go fast. It wouldn't go, wouldn't go fast long periods of time, but boy, it'd get up and move. I mean, it would move in a hurry. And I got out with her ripping around and having me a good time and I'd let off the gas pedal just a little bit so I wouldn't twist the you joint out. And, and by the way, somebody came in there, our uh, yard here at the church, somebody drove up there in, in our yard and, and cut donuts, spun uh, ruts in our yard and uh, then drove down through the ditch. And if that was you, I want to talk to you after church. But if that was not you, uh, I, I, you know, if that happens again, I hope the U-joint twists off in the middle of the grass and Dave is the one that shows up and finds him. Back to my story, I was racing around. And a guy by the name of Buff Lamb mm, pulled me over and I'd been had. He carried this big flashlight, long flashlight, about that long, right? It's probably that long, it's huge. Anybody know anything about him? He'd put, I think, the, I think the flashlight held 27 batteries. I'm not sure, but and he didn't have the nightstick. He had a flashlight. He got out of his car tapping it. My hand tapping it in his other hand. He said, young man, you're going home, aren't you? 
I said, yes, sir, right after you give me a ticket. He said, I'm not giving you a ticket. I got a good mind to turn you over my knees and bless you. And he used another word. He said, I'm going to send you home. And he said, I'll get a hold of Martha, Jane, and Guy tomorrow. I said, just, just hit me now. But I'd been had. Amen. <laughs> but thank God Jesus Christ has redeemed me and washed me in the blood of Christ. And I'm glad that I'm on my way to heaven and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And no matter what comes my way, the cross still stands for James Akins. And the cross still stands for you and I. That cross stands for Ozark Full Gospel Church. That cross stands for the world. That cross stands for the love of God. That cross stands for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The cross still stands. And nothing can separate that cross from Jesus Christ. It was there he died for my sins. It was there he shed his blood for the sins of the world and not for my sins only but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ broke the powers of death, hell and grave and died on that cross and was rolled into a tomb and there the, the, the stone sealed shut. But three days and three nights later up from the grave Jesus Christ arose resurrected from the dead risen from the, uh, from the power of death, hell and the grave and today the cross still stands and the tomb still empty. Mm -mm -mm. the cross is a resting place for our faith the struggle the struggle is real but God is real too not only is the cross a resting place for our faith but the cross will stand as a medicine for the broken hearts. The cross is a medicine for the broken hearts. Listen to Galatians chapter one, verse four, who gave himself for our sins, speaking of Jesus, that he might deliver us from, the pre from this present evil world. How many would agree that we live in a present evil world? According to the will of God, and our Father, notice he says that he would deliver us, deliver us, forgive us of our sin in this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. What is the will of God our Father? To deliver us from this present evil world. What is the will of our Father? That we would come to repentance and be forgiven of our sin. What is the will of the Father? That the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world would come to us and that we would come to him and that he would wrap his arms around us and never, never let us go and give unto us eternal life and we shall never perish. Who gave himself for our sins, he that knew no sin. Isaiah 53 verse 4, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Notice that surely he had borne, that don't mean just carried. That means in the pit of his stomach, that means in the very depth of his soul, he carried our griefs and he carried our sorrows. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. He's the healer. And that cross stands as a medicine for our broken hearts. When we stand at the graveyard, that cross stands as a medicine for our broken hearts. When we stand in the darkness of the night and our lives are shattered like, grass, like glass all around us, that cross still stands at a medicine for us. If we trip and stumble, fall and sin, and go back to the world and get into wickedness and evil, that cross still stands for us. And on a cross far away, Stood an old rugged cross on a hill far away, stands an old rugged cross. 
And you may be far away from God, but on that hill where Jesus Christ bled and died on Golgotha's hill on that cross, he says to everyone, no matter where you are or how far you are away, that God still loves you and Jesus is still in the saving business and Jesus is a healer of our soul and he'll heal your heart, amen. I love Chuck Krause's singing. I love his singing. And by the way, don't tell Terry I said this, but Daryl Nimmer, you did as good as Terry. But anyway. But I love, I love Chuck's singing. Now, ain't nobody can get a, a, a hymnal, a song book, and get a hymnal and squeeze the juice out of it like Chuck can. And if Chuck don't get enough juice out of it, he'll make some of his own. Because he'll make up verses. He got up here one time and sung 16 stanzas of one song. And I don't think there was but about three or four of them. I never get tired of hearing him sing. I never get tired of his billorous voice. I never get tired of him singing them old hymns. They're awesome. And Chuck, you do an awesome job. And I'm proud to be your brother in Christ and proud the fact that you sing and love the Lord. But one of the bestest, and I know that's not much of a word, bestest, bestest, one of the bestest singing he ever did in his life was when he got up one Sunday morning down on the square, and he's done it here too in other places, and got up and pulled out an old hymn and old Chuck, you know, Chuck has got that, that real loud voice and he sings, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. He said, that's just a child's song. That's just children's song. Yeah, the children of the Lord, the children of God. And I'm glad that he loves us, and I'm glad that he takes care of us. And the cross is medicine for the broken heart. Jesus took anything that you have done wrong. Jesus took any upset, any pain in your life. He took it all. See, Jesus did not just take the sin. He did. He took all of our sins. But Jesus did not just take the sin, but he took the grief. And not just the grief of sin, but the grief of all of us. Jesus took not just the grief of sin and the grief of all of us, even if it had nothing to do with sin, the grief. And Jesus took all of our sorrows. He took all of our guilt, all of our shame. He took it all on that cross that still stands. And on that cross, he brought to us the message that God still loves you. That God will always love you. That God will always be there for you. That God will never abandon you. That God cares for you and God will take you through and God will bring you out. And though your heart hurts and though your, your very depth of your, the bedrock of your soul aches with pain, Jesus Christ can say to you, I've been there. I've been there. I've been there at the rock bottom. I've been there at the bottom of the hill. I've been there in the depths of despair. I've been there when friends betrayed me. I've been there when evil men crucified me. I've been there when I did nothing but good, but people still uh, uh, blaspheme me and come against me. I've been there in rejection. I've been there in persecution. I've been there in loss. I've lost John the Baptist by being beheaded. I lost uh, uh, the closest uh, cousin that was to me, John the Baptist lost him. I've been there in death. I've been there in, in, the, in the sickness. And, and, and as much as Jesus Christ loved John the Baptist, he did not go and raise him from the dead. He let him be because he let him roll on in the glory land and go on to be with his God, his Father in heaven. And, and, and Jesus says to everyone in this room, I've been there. I've been where you hurt. I've been where you've uh, uh, suffered. I've been there where you ache. I've been there where you've been lonely. I've been there in the darkness and he says 
on the cross. I took it all so that you can look to me and trust me and love me and I will give unto you eternal life and I will take you home to be with me and you will never perish because Jesus Christ is the sovereign Lord of the universe and conqueror of death, hell, and the grave. The cross still stands as a medicine. Number three, the cross inspires love. I said the cross inspires love. Ephesians 5, 2, he speaks to you and I, walk in love. As Christ also have loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Now I want you to notice that in this verse two of Ephesians five, he says that Jesus Christ offered two things. He made himself an offering. Well, himself was sacrificed, but he offered God two things here. He made himself an offering and a sacrifice and a sweet smelling savor. With his offering and with his sacrifice, he had incense, the sweet smelling savor before his father. But notice, don't miss this. He offered himself, the Bible says, an offering. Please don't miss this. An offering is valuable. An offering is costly. An offering is from yourself. An offering is very costly. And not only did Jesus Christ offer the most costly thing that anyone could ever offer, that's his own life. He offered the most priceless thing he had. He offered himself. A priceless gift to you and I. A price that is beautiful, above price, a beautiful offering for our sins. Isn't that beautiful? Not only that, he made a sacrifice. And stop and think about the sacrifice. We're talking about the one that raised Lazarus from the dead. We're talking about the one that opened blinded eyes. We're talking about the man that cleansed the leper. We're talking about the man that walked on water, that calmed the raging storm. We're talking about the one that performed miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, went about doing good because God was with him. And we're talking about the one, the Son of God, that went out and did all these great miracles. And John said in the conclusion of his book, if it were written everything that he had done that was magnificent and extraordinary, if it were written everything that Jesus had done, the books, the earth could not contain, the world could not contain the books that should be written about him, about Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ offered himself on that cross. And I want to say right now that Jesus, when he died on that cross, there was a sweet smelling savor. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again because I like saying it. But sin stinks. I said, sin stinks. Hello? I don't care if a man's a sinner, a woman a sinner, living in sin, everything they have stinks. But Jesus Christ came to remove the stench from our life. And God's people, look up here, God's people are the most attractive people on planet Earth. Hello? Amen? You're attractive because of not what you wear and not the makeup or whatever you put on. You're attractive not because you were born with a pretty face. 
you're attractive because you have that glow about you that only Jesus Christ can put on a child of God. Amen? And so the cross of Calvary is a beautiful place there, and it is a place that inspires love. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Unto him, speaking of Jesus, unto Jesus that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, how could you not love someone like that? How could you not love Jesus Christ? I mean, awesome, amen? How could, how could anyone not love Jesus Christ? Last but not least, the cross is an unfinished story. I said the cross is an unfinished story. You say, well, at first that statement seems a little odd. No, it's not odd. Jesus Christ finished the powers of wickedness on the cross. Jesus Christ said it is finished on the cross, meaning that the perfect sacrifice has been made and there's nowhere else to go but to him. But the cross isn't finished. The cross has an unfinished story. Because each one of us that has a story about Jesus, each one of us, what is it? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. It talks about, I have a story. And you, you sing that story. Well, the truth is, everyone that's born again has a story. Everybody that's saved has a story. You know where it began? At the cross. That's where your story began. At the love of God, at the cross of Calvary, that's where your story began. If your story begins before the cross, boring. I don't want to hear how bad and ugly and mean you were. I want to hear about how awesome and incredible and lovely Jesus is. Amen. Amen. I think too many times people glorify their past too much and people want to have a past. I don't want a past. I got rid of mine. I don't want a, I don't want a past. For some people live in their past and want to be around their past so much, it's almost like their past is a kissing cousin. Won't let it go. But you know, I, I wouldn't, hey listen, I wouldn't have someone come into this church and share their wicked, ugly, horrible past and talk to our people through a testimony how bad they were, and then Jesus came and rescued them. I would not invite them to come and give their testimony to this church because there's too much glorification of their sin. There's too much glorification of their past. And some little child out there will hear that testimony and think they've got to go the same path. Give me someone that'll get up and say, I've never drank a beer. I've never took, smoked marijuana. I've never lived in sin as far as outward stealing and robbing. But I was as guilty as anybody else on my way to hell without Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ saved me. That's the testimony that blows all the rest of them out of the water. Jesus comes to save us. Amen? The, un, the cross is an unfinished story. Jesus said, in John chapter 6, Jesus Christ said, I'm going to die. In John chapter 6, verse um, 55 and on, it says, Jesus said, I'm going to die. But in John chapter 6, 57, Jesus Christ said, As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. And Jesus preached quite a message about partaking of Christ, and partaking of his blood, and partaking of his bread. And Jesus said, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. And that sixth chapter was one sermon that if the preacher got up and preached it, he probably would lose his entire audience. And the Bible says that when Jesus preached, you've got to eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, preach on the bread of life, you have no life. 
And when Jesus preached that, the Bible says many went away. They walked away. And Jesus Christ asked the disciples, will you go away also? And Peter responds in verse 68 and 69 of John 6. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter says, to whom shall we go? Jesus Christ said, Jesus Christ said, eat my words, be nourished, be nourished by them, be comforted by them, be strong by them, take my life, take my sacrifice, take my death, take my cross, take my bread, take my blood, take my life, and take my word and live. That's what Jesus Christ is saying. Believe me, take me and live. And Peter said, if I don't have you, when Jesus said, will you go away? Peter said, to whom shall we go? And I'll conclude with the thoughts today. To whom shall we go with our sins? To whom shall we go with our sins? There isn't nobody but he that died on that cross of Calvary that's worthy to wash our sins away. To whom shall we go with our sins? Number two, to whom shall we go for blessed assurance? Blessed assurance. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 10, verse 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. To whom shall we go with our sorrows? To whom shall we go with our black nights, our, our shattered dreams, our, our lives that have been broken? To whom shall we go when we're going through a hard time? Apostle Peter said in chapter 5, verse 7, 1 Peter, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Amen. I share this at funerals a lot when I'm doing a funeral, and I had one just recently, and I share this illustration. Judy and I, we've had seven babies. Now they're not babies, they're grown. And that scripture, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you, is a picture of a nurse or a mother that takes a baby and the baby's got a bellyache. And Judy and I have had, of course, seven and one thing I've discovered when they were little, they always did their business on the way to church. So, you know, it wasn't turning around going back home. We just took care of it on the way to church. We're going to get beat out of church. No dirty diapers going to keep us out of church. But you take a little baby with a bellyache, and a little baby's got a problem with the bellyache, and you take that baby and lay it across your shoulder. And you begin to rub its little back, and you begin to nurture it because it's hurting. It's soured. The stomach's soured. And that little baby will go, <coughs> and all over all over its mommy. Not me, because I learned after the first time to not be doing that. Some father you are, preacher. Yeah, I'm a father. I got some brains. Anyway. But Peter's giving an illustration. You can be soured. You can be hurt. And God will take you up in his arms and he'll pat you. He'll rub your little back. <coughs> and God will just let all that run all over him on the cross of Calvary. God will just let all that inside turmoil be expelled on the cross of Calvary. And Jesus will take you in his arms. And he will love you all the way into glory. The cross has unfinished business. Probably we got someone in this room right now that there's some unfinished business that the cross has with you. There may be someone in this room right now that you maybe you've never been saved or maybe you've backslid and you've drifted away from the Lord. 
And the cross has some unfinished business with you. So, oh, I got to go to the judgment. I've sinned and I'm vile. I, 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 I'm afraid of God and I got to go to the judgment. No, 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 no. Go to the judgment that the Father poured out upon his son. Go to Jesus Christ. He took your judgment. He took your son. Go to the cross. You can start there brand new. Go to the cross. You can start there with a brand new life. Go to the cross. You can start there. There's medicine for your soul. There's forgiveness for you. There's a washing of the blood of Christ for you. Go to the cross. Your story can begin there. Don't end your story at the great white throne judgment. Go to the cross and end your story with well done thy good and faithful servant. End your story with let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me for in my Father's house are many mansions. Go to the cross and let Jesus Christ take you through the garden and through the tomb, and out on the other side, hand in hand with the resurrected Christ. Isn't that good? The cross still stands. To whom shall you go with your sorrow? To whom shall you go with your sickness? To whom shall you go with your pain and suffering? To whom shall you go with your heartache? To whom shall you go with your, with your sin? To whom shall you go when it's time to die? To whom shall you go when, when it looks like everything around you is going to shatter like glass above your life? To whom shall you go? Jesus Christ said in the world, last verse of chapter 16 of John, uh, last verse 33, in the world ye shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ gives us peace and gives us grace. I've spoken these things unto you that in me ye might have peace. It all starts at the cross. The cross still stands, having peace through the blood of his cross. Woo, I'm on my way. I say, whoo, I'm on my way. Preacher, you just make me nervous when you go, whoo! Well, you better work things out with that because when you get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of, whoo! be a lot of shouting and praising God. And I don't think Peter's going to be passing out um, tranquilizers and, and earplugs as you go through the gate. I don't, think, I don't think Peter would be at the gate anyway. Would you want to stand at the gate? Come on, honest. Jerry, would you want to stand at the gate? I don't think so. God has angels for that. I'm not going to stand at the gate. I'm going to be in there where it's happening. I'm going to be there where the glorified buffet is. Me on the on the sea of glass and praising God and glorifying God. I'm gonna be there where camp meetings going on, where heaven's is is touching down. I'm gonna be there where Jesus is tapping his toes and angels are being shook around, and the glory of God's gonna be throbbing in that place. Amen. Thank God. One of these days, one of these days, God's gonna say to one of His angels. Go get the devil. And the devil's going to be hit out in one of them black holes in the universe somewhere. And an angel's going to go find that old rat, that devil, and pull him out of that black hole. And going to bring him down to the throne room where Jesus Christ is. And going to throw him down at the feet of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to say, bow, confess. Jesus is Lord. Now, I don't know if it happened exactly like that, but I know this. If I was a devil, I'd be in a black hole somewhere. Hiding. His days are up. He just wants to pick on us. I just say pick on someone more your size. In fact, he wanted to be God. Pick on him. You'll find out that he made a bad choice. Amen? Stand with me. Josh's going to bring a song.
I could preach all night. He said, preacher, you might as well you preached all morning. Well, you know, could you tell I got into the message? Could you tell I was kind of into it? I was enjoying this. Amen. I've been enjoying this. Question. Question. Does the cross have some unfinished business for you? Would you like to come to the cross? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. There my burden was rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. And now I'm happy. Now I'm happy. Would you come? The altar's open.